Mark chapter 4. As you turn there, I'm reminded of a story that took place about a year ago now. I loaded the family up and we went to Fort Worth, Texas so I could graduate from seminary in a doctoral program. But I wanted my family to have a true Fort Worth experience. And I wanted to make sure they went to the stockyards and went to Joe T. Garcia's. And this is a picture we took there right outside of the, uh, we're going to go to the rodeo. I wanted to go to the rodeo, take them to the rodeo. And uh, they're ready to go. They were a little disturbed by the rodeo, by the way, so we may not go back to the rodeo. But we're outside of the rodeo, and I pull the tickets out to the rodeo, and I notice that I bought tickets for the wrong night. I bought tickets for the week before. So the Saturday before, so I didn't have tickets to the rodeo. Now, fortunately... I could buy extra tickets at the gate for the rodeo. But I thought I had a ticket, but I didn't. Wrong date, wrong time. And it, I think this story sets us up today because Jesus, in, in Mark 4, he's talking to an audience. They think they have a ticket to the kingdom, but they don't. They are disillusioned, different day, different time on the ticket. And so what Jesus does here is he tells a parable. And this is the parable of all parables that kind of set the stage for other parables. This is the parable of the soils. Now, a parable, it's brilliant the way that Jesus taught. A parable, here's how I defined a parable. A parable is, is earthly stories with eternal significance. Earthly stories with eternal significance. And this par parable uses a plant imagery that helps us test our faith and authenticate our faith. So I want to talk to you briefly today about a message entitled, Receiving the Seed into Our Soul. Receiving the Seed into Our Soul our soul. And Matthew 4 is going to show us a visual, if you will, of why some people don't receive the seed of the gospel. And if we are honest today, many of those people are listening to this sermon right now. Just to prepare for what's about to go down, some of you are going to relate in a way to say, you know what, Chad? You're talking to me. I've been disillusioned. I've been distracted. I've deluded the gospel. And so Jesus here, okay, so setting the stage, he's early in his ministry. He's gaining a following. He's drawing large crowds with his sermons. And listen to the pulpit that he's preaching from in Mark 4. This is fascinating. Verse 1 starts, again, he, be he began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. Verse 2. He was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them. Now stop right there. It's here in the text. It's going to show us four ways to receive the seed of the gospel into our soul, all right? Four ways to receive the seed into our soul. Number one, if you're taking notes, we must protect, we must protect our hearts from being calloused. We must protect our hearts from being calloused. Now, to understand the picture, the seed is God's word. And the soil, the four soils, represent the human heart of reception. All right? You just need to know that before we start kind of rolling through this text. Now look at verse 3. Jesus says, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path. And the birds came and 
devoured it. Now the soul of the path, this is hardened. People have walked along this soil. The seed could not penetrate through the soil and take root. It was along the path. It was not where the seed was intended to be planted. It's along the path where people are walking. And so consequently, this crowded thoroughfare cannot make room for the seed to take root. And so as a result, the seed, watch this, was susceptible to be devoured by the birds. You see it? So the birds came and took the seed from the path. Now, the bird here is a word picture for Satan. That he steals the seed of the gospel that does not penetrate through the soil. Now, biblical scholars agree, by the way, that Jesus is speaking to people who are hearers of the word, but not doers of the word. They listen. It's there. They know it, but they don't show it. In fact, they could be interested. They could be intrigued. But they see Christianity, they see church more like entertainment and enjoyment. Hey, tell me what I think I need to hear. Inspire me. Tickle my ears and and help me like feel a sense of hope and encouragement. But, but... I don't want it to like pierce and penetrate through my soul and my heart and, and, and excavate the, the cold and callous sin that's inside. Don't, don't go there. We're closed off. And, and here's, a, here's, a, here's a strange thought. It, it would almost be like this. What would you do if you're driving along the road and all of a sudden, you saw a corn stalk growing right in the middle of the highway. You're like, where, where did that come from? How did that happen? Like, somebody please tell me, how did a car not run over it? It would be strange and surprising, even in, inconceivable, and let's be honest, impossible. What Jesus is declaring here is that the soil of their heart is so, listen, hardened by the traffic of this world, they have made it nearly impossible for the seed to implant into their heart. Impossible. And the saddest part, listen, the saddest part of this is that many of these people, Jesus, that he's talking to, they're good people. They're religious people. They obey the rules. They pay their taxes. They believe in religion. They hear sermons week in and week out. But the gospel seed lies dormant on the surface of their soul, never taking root. Why? Their their, their heart has built up a callous wall of sin that is impenetrable and is as hard as Pharaoh's heart. Completely calloused. One story, a lot of stories come to mind, uh, but uh, our staff, they know this. We talk about uh, things like this often, but uh, as you could probably imagine, you know, I keep up with a lot of pastors, a lot of preachers throughout the country. I listen to podcasts every day. I listen to preaching and sermons and Bible studies, and one of the most influential pastors in the a Baptist convention, um, said this. He said this. He said, we should never test the grace of God. This is some strong truth. Truth, by the way. The man of God must be blameless and the model, the message of the gospel. In the same way that I cannot drive my car when there is mud on the windshield, a preacher cannot rightly see the word of God when there's mud in his life. And to that, I would say amen. In fact, this pastor actually released a statement on the systemic fall of pastors to adultery. Listen to what he said. He said, you are a fool of all fools for 15 seconds of gratification. 
and now you're no longer a pastor. What a fool you were to sacrifice an entire life of ministry to 20 seconds of sin. You fool. And while the 73-year-old preacher was preaching this sermon, he was having an affair with a 20-year-old. Listen, you can believe it in your head, but if you don't believe it in your heart, you can say one thing and you can live another the seed did not take implantation. This is, the, this is the person that makes a commitment to Jesus, but they don't follow through. There's no root. It's the person that has the emotional experience of euphoria. They pray a brief prayer after walking through a judgment house, and they never step into God's house. You know what I'm talking about? This is uh, the person that placed their faith in a church or a pastor that let them down, and then they, 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 they didn't take root in the gospel, so they just leave the church. The gospel has to take root. So number one, church, we must protect our hearts from being calloused. There's a lot of things that's going to callous our hearts. Number two, we must purify our hearts from being contaminated. We must purify our hearts from being contaminated. Look at verse 5. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and it immediately sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it what? It withered away. It sprouted, but it did not spread. It germinated but it did not grow. Listen, sprouting rises up, but growing anchors down deep. There's a difference. The seed here fell on top of the soil, but it did not go into the inner surface. It was the subsurface. So there were rocky interferences and a lack of moisture. In other words, the seed was not in a conducive environment for growth and health. Now, practically speaking, this is the person who, listen, they're excited to read God's Word. They're excited to go to church. In fact, they may even invite people to church. But over time, there is a contamination inside that creates this faith interference from the gospel seed taking root. They lose faith over time. They excuse. They have wrong priorities to keep them away from from church. They allow a direct message on social media to interfere with their time with God and they exchange a relationship with God with a relationship with an emotional affair. Look, don't get me wrong. These people, they are deeply impressed. They are inspired by God's Word, but there's no transformational fruit. These are people who may confess Christ, but there's no contrition. Do you see it? There's no contrition. There's a one-time faith, but there's not a continual following. And Charles Spurgeon, he, uh, he was so discouraged, one of the greatest pastors to ever preach. Um, he was so discouraged, he was defeated about his church. Um, and uh, on, on one Sunday, he was in his, his prayer closet after church. He uttered these words, listen. I have been deceived. My converts are fickle. Their religion has withered as the green herb. Now, my favorite herb is cilantro, so it lasts a solid week, all right? Um, these people have a joy in the moment, but it's not joy everlasting. It's not joy everlasting. Now, if this is you, this is the most important thing uh, you need to hear. Just write this down. Christianity is not that thing you try Christianity is a transformation you live. Christianity is a transformation you live. Listen, God's Word will never disappoint. God's Word will always come through. God's Word will never fail, 
when your roots are dug deep. Now, most of you know my heart. You know my bent. Um, every pastor, every preacher is bent differently. I, I'm bent towards evangelism. You know, that's why I like having these, you know, revival days. And, and I want to see people come to know Christ. I want to see people, you know, in the baptistry. Um, let, let me tell you a little bit about this week. Uh, it was fascinating what happened. Um, uh, many of you know that I, I used to be on the college campus. I spent over a decade on the college campus with Baptist student ministry and uh, BSU, BSM, and BCM, depending on what state you're in, determines what the name of it is. But anyway, this past week, over 6,000 students at the Hump in Starkville went to a worship service. Over 7,000 students went to the pavilion in Oxford to a worship service. Thousands accepted Christ. Thousands were baptized. Now, look, glory to God, right? Glory to God. Now, I've got friends in Starkville. I've got friends in Oxford. I'm burning up the phones. Like, what's going on? This is amazing. Revival's breaking out. You know, it's like Billy Graham, good old days, right? And, uh, and I'll be honest. Can I, can I be honest with you? I got some mixed reviews. I got some mixed reviews. Uh, one person particularly said, Chad, well, <laughs> what are they baptizing these students into? Because our churches weren't there and our ministries weren't there. And I don't know about you, but it's hard enough to baptize somebody in a church and get them connected to the church versus baptizing them outside and getting them to go into a church. So all that to simply say, church, whatever we do, we want to position people in such a way that the gospel would take root in their lives. Because look, nobody's more evangelistic than me. But it's very possible that we get people to echo a prayer, sign a card, show up to revival once, show up to an Easter service once, show up to Judgment House once, show up to an event, make a decision, and they're banking on that to get them into heaven? Really? Anchor down. Make sure the gospel takes root. Real faith takes root. Real faith perseveres. Real faith is faithfulness and commitment to the gospel. So we've got to protect our hearts from being callous. Number two, we've got to purify our hearts from being contaminated. And number three, we must prune our hearts from being choked. We must prune our hearts from being choked. Verse 7 says this, Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Now these thorns, you probably can imagine, these are forces of evil that choke out our faithfulness in Christ. And the seed tried to take root, but the thorns choked it out. That's the cares of this life, the riches of this world, the pleasures of this earth. Choke out the seed of the gospel. And, and let me just pause right here and put some specific names to these thorns. You ready? One I thought about is the thorn of screen time. You know what I'm talking about? Screen time? I'm talking about your phone, I'm talking about the computer, I'm talking about the TV, um, all the above. The, the fictional life that we live on the screen chokes out the real life we are living in society. Now, I, I, I want to be faithful to God's Word, uh, but let me just mention something, just sidebar. You may not agree, and that's fine. Uh, you're a parent, you can do whatever you want. But something that we have dealt with in the Logan home lately, and something that I am uh, looking into, just be honest, uh, one of the things that we started noticing, and, and uh, you, you'll know who I'm talking about, who's not here, um, but uh, is that, that there was a behavioral difference when he played video game. There was a behavioral difference. And, and uh, when he played certain games, there were even more disconcerting behaviors. And so we 
as uh, parents, pretty much cut some things out. And, and this is what we said, and, and, and we were thinking it, and, we, and so we just said it. This was about 11 at, at night one night, me and, me and Kelly. Uh, we could read each other, and, and, and she said it first, and I said I was about to say the same thing. I said, the reason that we're dealing with so many mass shootings is because our children cannot separate virtual reality from reality on video games. Now, we can talk about other issues, we can talk about mental health, but that mental health is a direct connectivity. Now, I, you know, I'm just going to drop that in your lap, parents. You know, you can take that for, for what you will. But these are choking out the spiritual life of our children. Other weeds, our, our career, our appearance, our power, our popularity, they're weeds that distract us from soaking up the rich nutrition of the gospel in our life. And these weeds are a slow process, by the way. It's not an overnight deal. And it's possible, you've been in, you know, the whole Christian sphere for 50 years, you've never grown because there's weeds all around you. You've never gotten rid of. Now hear me out. This is, this is a warning to all of us. But these first three soils, I am convinced are people who have a temporary faith and make false conversions. False conversions. What do you mean, Chad? That's a great question. What creates a false conversion, listen, is not someone who doesn't believe Jesus is who he says he is. That's not false conversion. False conversion, listen carefully, is someone who fails to genuinely repent. Someone who fails to genuinely repent. When they see sin, there's a holy hatred to sin. Now, why do I say this? It's real simple. We're reading through the Gospels right now. You go back and you look at John the Baptist's first sermon. You look at Jesus' first sermon. You know what you'll see every time? Repent. It was their first sermon. Repentance. And 21st century American Christianity has so lowered the standard of repentance, listen, that biblical Christianity is hardly even recognized because there are so many false converts. And what Jesus is saying is that the first three soils are fake converts. There's no such thing as a fruitless Christian. No root, no fruit. Lastly, here we go. Round and third base. Lastly, we must prepare our hearts from being corrupted. We must prepare our hearts from being corrupt, corrupted. Look, look, look at verse 8. And other seeds fell into the good soil, produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding. Listen, this is great. 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. Verse 9, he said, He who has ears, let him hear. So this is the good soil. This is the soil that's softened and seasoned to receive the Word of God. They see the weeds around them, they cut them out. And here's the most exciting part of the parable. Look, it said the seed yielded a hundredfold. In other words, listen, it's real easy to know if you're a believer. True followers mature. True followers multiply. And if we're honest, this is our tendency... We're great at testing the soil in other people's lives, but we're not great at testing the soil in our own life. Oh, I know that person. They, I mean, their soul is hardened by the darkness of drugs, the, the scars of their situation. But listen, yeah, the, the, the parable is, is both introspective and external, but hear me out. We're not called to be the soil tester in other people not what we're called to do we're called to be the seed spreader for other people that's our that's our mission it's not our job to analyze their soil it's our job to analyze our soil sow the seeds everywhere we go we sow and so this parable is both about receiving the gospel and sharing the gospel and so let me just kind of sum this up uh, give you an insight into the directive here for this parable and here's how I'd sum that up. Listen, bad soil is the result of a hardened heart. 
Good soil is the result of a humble heart. That's it. That's it. And I'm not here to, you know, to say that the percentages work out here, but notice in the parable that only one in four of these soils produce a harvest. Only one in four. Only one in four persevere in their faith because of the root system. Now, it's fascinating. Uh, redwood trees out in California, if you know much about redwood trees, they can be over 350 feet tall. Now, some are over 2,200 years they've been around. One piece of bark, 12 inches. But what's most fascinating is not what you see externally on the redwood tree. What's fascinating is what you don't see. And what you don't see is the root system. Now, the root system is fascinating in and of itself. It expands over 100 feet from the tree. And the root system interconnects with other roots of nearby redwoods. Now, this should teach us something, church. This interconnectivity provides a sense of stability and support, making them the most resilient trees in the world. Church, Christian, don't you see it? We were made for each other. That's the church. That's a picture of the church that we root down in our faith and interconnect with other people. And so the question that we just want to end with is, is this. Which soil are you? Honestly. If there's something in your heart that you've not repented of that's creating a barrier of the seed of the gospel taking root in your heart, which of the three are you? If your heart's callous, contaminated, and choked, do not leave today in your sin. Follow Jesus. We have to accept the word, have to absorb the word, and apply the word to harvest the true gospel. And for the rest of us who, whose heart is good soil, the question for us is this, are you producing a harvest in your life? Is your faith increasing? We have to accept the word, but we have to absorb the word. And that's how we accept the seed of the gospel to our souls.